Yes, my name is Richard Young. I'm the director of education at this place called the Food Service Technology Center. How many people are familiar with the Food Service Technology Center? About half of you guys. That's good, OK? And there's a lot of new people here. This is one reason I took a risk, OK? One reason that I put so much information in is that I've met a lot of new people here. There are a lot of folks that don't know what we do. But I do also know that you're a very high level audience. And so I figured I could give you a lot of information in a hurry and that you'd absorb it. But there were some things, because I have new friends or people that have never heard of us, there were some things I just absolutely had to put in this presentation. So we ready? Everybody strapped in? You've, got, you've had your coffee? Do I seem kind of energetic? It's pretty cool considering I'm stone cold asleep. I'm from California. I don't wake up until after this presentation. OK, so. You guys get to make fun of me. Uh, the who, one of the big who's about us, probably the most important thing is that we are an unbiased, publicly funded research center. We study all the ways that commercial food service uses energy and water. We do only study commercial food service. We look at energy efficiency and performance, and we'll touch on that a little bit. And this year, this summer, we'll be celebrating 30 years of doing this. We essentially invented this field of study 30 years ago, and I've been there 28 of those 30 years. Started when I was five years old. I was a child prodigy. Um, yes, you can laugh. It's OK. That's a joke. I'm not actually 30-something years old. I'm way. <laughs> Uh, so, you see Fishnick, we're going to learn Fishnick, we're going to learn about the Food Service Technology Center, Fisher Nickel Inc., all this complicated stuff. I want to show you kind of a graphic real quick that kind of explains it. And some of you who have known me for a long time, like Brandon, you already understand this, right? But the Food Service Technology Center is a PG&E utility facility. But I'm not a PG&E employee. I'm not a utility employee, right? So don't throw any tomatoes at me, right? It's OK. I'm a consultant. And we have always, our consulting firm, Fisher Nickel Inc., has always run the Food Service Technology Center. We're kind of unicorns in this big world of energy efficiency. So PG&E owns the center. We've run it forever. And we partnered with PG&E all of this time. Does that kind of make sense, clear as mud? So I'm both a public and a private person. Is that, can we just live with that? Let's just go with that for now. That'll be, uh, by the way, you're going to want my handouts. Uh, I'm actually going to, I'll make a PDF, send them to Michael, but you can also get them on the website, fishnick.com, handouts with an S, and today's date. Here's why you want to write that down if you don't write anything else down, because that is a secret code to all of our handouts. So if you see that we're speaking at, FCSI or NAFM, or we're giving presentations at our lab, and you can't be there, that's a secret handshake that gets you to all of those presentations. And it's not, you're not going to be able to Google that. You have to know the code, OK? Really difficult code, like real tough CIA stuff. Everybody got that? There's like 60 slides. You're going to, you're going to want to pull those down. OK. So. Here's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to have a little fun, take a little journey through a few subjects. The first one is cutting waste as important as growth. We talked some about growth. Yesterday, we were talking about store growth, like how do we grow this industry. Um, I'm going to make a pitch here, OK? So we're going to see. We're going to play with that. The second one thing is, can energy productivity help cut waste? What the hell is energy productivity? I don't know. I'm going to introduce that today. We're going to talk about that a little bit. New concept, new way of looking at things. And then finally, what is net zero energy, and why should you care? Right? Why do we care about this zero net energy thing? Is this a future for us? Is this something important? Well, I'm going to make a pitch for that as well. So this is our winding road. But because it is 8.20 in the morning, we're going to start off with a game. OK, we're going to warm the brain up. We'll have a little fun. Is that OK? I promised everybody a game. So let's just play a little game. And this game revolves around uh, taking my son to see the movie Chef. How many people saw Chef? Everybody, some, some of you guys saw Chef? So the premise is that the LA chef uh, loses his gig at the fancy restaurant, is estranged from his wife and son. They fly back to Miami, where he buys a food truck. He, uh, he teaches his kid about the restaurant business. His kid teaches him about social media. They drive back across the country by the time they get back to LA. They are rock stars in social media. And um, the LA critic gives him money to reopen a new restaurant. Right? It's, it's Hollywood. OK, it is Hollywood. But it's a beautiful movie, has a great soundtrack, and it's a lot of fun. And there's this father-son component. So it was kind of fun to take my son. My son is an engineer uh, graduating soon, and he was interning in our lab. So it was kind of he's learning about what I did. I took him to see the movie. You guys OK? Everybody OK out there? You're just looking a little, just looking a little glassy-eyed. How many people are still alive? <laughs> That's most of you, so that's good. OK. All right. This will be fun, you guys. So I took my son to see Chef. Now, in the movie Chef, Chef is trying to teach his son about equipment. He needs to outfit the, um, outfit the food truck. By the way, the, the chef is serving two, really two staple foods in his food truck, Cabano sandwiches and beignets. 
okay? This is why, if you've noticed a, an explosion of Cabano sandwiches on menus, uh, this is why, it's this movie. Uh, but what's he making the money off of, of those two? Where's the profit? Food service professionals, where's the profit? It's the beignets, hell yeah, he's not making money off the Cabano sandwich, but if you can throw a little flour and some oil, okay? So his money maker is his fryer. And he goes to pick his fryer with his son, and they walk by, and he goes, hey, do you know what this is? And his son says, yeah, it's a defect fryer, and he goes, I'll take that one. Okay, and that's it. That's as much time as he spends on the decision. Then he gets to the checkout counter. Come on. Oh, there we go. Sorry. Went too far. He gets to the checkout counter, and there's chef's knives in there. And he spends a lot of time with his son explaining the merits of the chef knife. He buys his son one, take care of this. If you see the movie, there's a, you know, a disproportionate amount of time over the knife. It's very touching. I understand the relation of chefs to their knives. But when I see this movie, I cannot you know, stop thinking about what I do and how this relates to what we do. So I said, I think there's a lesson in there. The question is, the fryer is the money maker, it's not the knife. If the chef had spent a little bit more time really studying that fryer and perhaps buying a slightly more efficient fryer, what would the payback be, okay? So this is our game. The game is called How Many Knives? All right, so what we're gonna do is, we're gonna say how many knives could the chef buy if he was more informed when he purchased his fryer? Okay, and the small business, so we're, we have two assumptions. The time period's five years. It's, this is a low cost, starter fryers, five years, okay? And a, and a chef knife costs 100 bucks for ease of use. So this is our game, how many knives? So I want everybody to choose a number and remember it, and don't share your number, okay? So everybody choose that number right now, five years. How many knives are we gonna have at the end of five years if the chef makes a little bit better equipment purchasing decision? Are we ready to play? Everybody ready to play, yes? Yes, yes. Somebody please pour some more coffee for my friends here. It's, okay. Let's just roll that espresso station right on in. Can we do that? Can we just roll that? Okay, let's have some fun. So here's what the chef's looking at. This is the first uh, glance equipment choice. It is a basic, you know, low-cost fryer that every, all these first-time businesses buy. You guys have probably bought some of these versus the, an entry-level energy-efficient fryer. Okay, doesn't cost that much more, uh, but higher efficiency. And in fact, because of our lab, because of the research that we've done in our lab, there are now four of these entry level energy efficient fryers on the market where they didn't exist five years ago. Okay, this is pretty amazing. We went to the industry, we proved this made sense, and manufacturers have started producing these fryers. Now, pretty much everybody in this room, you should be buying much higher than an entry level fryer, okay? But we're basing this around our entry level fryer today. We're basing the game. So here's what the chef sees when he goes to make his first decision. He sees a first cost. He sees a $700 fryer versus a $1,500 fryer. And what does he say? I'm gonna buy the $700 fryer because it's cheap. I'll have 700 bucks left over. I can buy a chef knife for my kid and I got $600 for beer money, right? And that's the decision most people make. That's how restaurants quite often make their purchasing decision on equipment. It's first price. Can I have an amen, right? Everybody makes it on, yeah, I mean, I got one. First price is usually the way you do it, okay? Is that wise? Well, let's find out. Here's how restaurants waste big dollars because you just look at that price tag. You don't look at the big picture, right? What do you need to do? You, you can't just look at first cost. You have to take in life, psych, life cycle analysis. Okay, you have to look at the big picture. And uh, Jeff Little, is Jeff in here? Del Taco was talking yesterday about life cycle analysis. It warmed my heart up. About 15 years ago, I remember talking to, and Brandon, you might have been there, to the MUFIS audience. And we tossed out the notion of life cycle and I thought they were gonna throw us out of the building. We can't do that, that's impossible. This is too much mathematics. And now people have learned how to do life cycle analysis, right, and for good reasons. So anyway, choose wisely. Choose wisely, why? Because one fryer is not like another. There are a lot of different fryers out there. A wide spectrum, here's 25 of the 200 fryers that we've tested. Uh, the ones that we're comparing, energy efficiency wise, here is the low cost fryer that the chef could have gotten and here, or that he did buy, and here is the 50% entry level energy efficient fryer that I want the chef to buy. Okay, that's the step up. And you can see there's pretty big difference, 30 to 50%. Are we okay? I, know I hate to hit you with numbers this early in the morning, but it, they're numbers with pictures, so it's okay, it's not too bad. Uh, so let's calculate some energy costs. Let's put some money behind this now, because I like the money equation. So let's look at this. If you want to do this, by the way, these calculators are totally free. How many people have used these calculators in the past, the fishing calculators? Andy has, yes. The useful Andy? Yeah, yeah, we find people, and, and hard to use? Absolutely not. And powerful, yes. These are the same calculators you can use if you're working on a lead building, okay? Or you can get in like two minutes, you can get a great answer. So here's what you do if you want to use them. You go to fishnick.com, 
Which, oh, by the way, that's our website. Oh, I shouldn't mention that. Fishnick, that's why I wear the shirt, fishnick.com. I want it to be burned into your memory. This is where you get back to all this good information. So the calculators, fishnick.com, you go to save energy. We didn't hide it. Uh, life cycle cost calculators, okay? And you can drop in a few simple pieces of information. In this case, you can grab the fryer you want. You put in how many hours, how many pounds of food. It's really not a lot. We fill in all of the complicated stuff for you. And you end up with numbers. So we know that the chef is saving about 615 bucks a year, okay? So now here's what the, uh, here's what the calculation looks like now. Here is that first price. Oh, it doesn't look so big anymore, does it? That ratio doesn't look so big. Here's the energy cost. And at the end of five years, if the chef bought the more efficient piece of equipment, uh, that's $2,300, right? 20, almost $2,400 that the chef has made in profit at the end of five years, which, by the way, completely paid for the fryer. The fryer became the more efficient fryer, completely free from a capital cost standpoint, paid for by energy efficiency with money left over, $1,000. Now he's got $1,000 in his pocket. How many chef knives is that, guys? How many? No, that's 23 chef knives, $2,300, $100 a chef knife, okay? Good. I know you. I was uh, hula. It was the hula. I'm sure. It's, uh, <laughs> you're free. If you need to revise your numbers now, your guess. It's <laughs> right. So this is kind of interesting. 23 chef knives. That's pretty good. Um, at a five percent profit, what is that? 2,300. You'd have to sell uh, about fifty thousand dollars worth of food to make 2,300. Right. And these days, five percent is pretty good for a lot of operators. But there's another level. Those who know me should know that I, I've always got a trick up my sleeve. Okay. So here's the fun part. You can also calculate performance. There are other things that go into purchasing a piece of equipment. In this case, I want to calculate in the cost of the oil because we have found through studies that more efficient fryers actually reduce oil cost. And oil is expensive, right? Should hear not see heads nodding. How many people out there spec use fryers, have fryers in their restaurants? Quite a few of you, right? How many people like French fries? If you're not raising your hand, you're not you know, American. Okay, come on, French fries, yeah. I eat really well, eat tofu and all that kind of junk, but I'm still, I will still eat French fries 28 years after I wrote the test method. Uh, it's kind of a joke around the lab. It's kind of pitiful, but it's totally true. <laughs> okay, so we did these oil life studies. High efficiency fryers save oil. In our study, it's 360 gallons a year, 360 gallons. It's like six jibs a month. So now let's look at the math once I add all this up. Okay, so there's the first price, right? There's the energy, there's the oil price at the end of five years. That's how much the chef has made. Small business person, at the end of five years, a chef's going to need a vacation. What kind of vacation could you take for $13,000? And that's profit. That's right to the bottom line. Okay? Uh, how many knives is that? 131 knives. How many people were within uh, 10 of that number? How about 20 of that number? How about 30 of that number? 30, I got 20, right? How about 30 of that number? 30 of that number. Brandon cheated. He probably used the calculator. How about 40 of that number? 40. Okay, Andy. 50? 60? 70? Okay, 80? 90? How many people just didn't give a damn, didn't guess anything? Okay. How many people guessed like 10, 20 knives? That's usually, you know, that's typically what you do, right? That's what I would do too. 10, 20 knives, you don't think it's 131 knives. By the way, at 5% profit, you'd have to sell $260,000 of beignets to make 13,000 bucks. Okay, did the chef make a good decision? No, he didn't make the greatest decision when he bought the low-cost fryer, okay? So this is my, this is my little wake-up call out there. There is money to be made. There's a lot of money to be made by cutting waste, okay? By the way, they set me up a perfect, this is not my backdrop, but thanks, AV guys, you gave me a perfect opportunity to point out another little piece of waste. I know a lot of, uh, so we, we look at equipment, we look at HVAC, we look at kitchen ventilation, all these things within our facility. Uh, another thing we look at is lighting. If you need a lighting expert, Brandon's sitting out there, right? Um, actually, when he was with Chipotle, I talked him into putting LEDs into, the, into Chipotle's all, all those years ago, so we go back. Um, these, these Edison lamps, food service people, design, how many architects, designers do I have out there? Okay, great. I know you love these lamps. I know you love them. You love them so deeply that I see them everywhere. Will you raise your right hand and, and repeat after me? Edison lamps are a decoration, okay? Decoration. They are not for general illumination. Decoration's fine, though. I love them. They're sexy. They look cool, okay? But they are not for general illumination. So don't light an entire damn store with these things, which I see all the time, because you are, they're space heaters. They were hip in 1890, okay? We don't deliver pizza by horseback anymore. Let it go. There are 112 of these down in the lobby of this hotel. 
okay, 112 of them, that could be replaced with really beautiful lamps used by hotels like Hyatt, right, because of my buddy at Tony Spot, Tony Spot. How many people know Tony Spot? I used to be manager of building systems. Yes, Andy knows from McDonald's, right? Any McDonald's folks in there? Yeah, and you don't know Tony? You know the legend of Tony, right? So, okay. Anyway, really good LEDs can replace these lamps. Uh, from a distance, you won't be able to tell the difference, right? Right up close, you go, oh, I can see it's an LED, but if we put them in, your customers would never know. Okay, another guessing game. Pick a number in your head. If we replaced all those uh, 112 lamps in the lobby with LED equivalents, uh, how much would this hotel save per year? Okay, ready for the number? $6,000. $6,000 they'd save, okay? How many people got within 1,000 bucks of that? Yeah, okay, good for you, lighting experts over here, right? So, is there waste? There's lots of waste out there. There's a lot of room to cut. So let's keep moving here. Uh, oh, and here's another piece. Now this is more for you guys in the room. I calculated performance a moment ago while I was talking about oil cost, right? But there's another way to calculate performance which is probably more pertinent to a lot of your business and that is productivity, that's performance, that's throughput. Because I'm never gonna tell you to buy something that's gonna slow down your productivity. I, had, I worked my way through engineering school in restaurants, I know what a busload of tourists is, I know that productivity is important, okay? So on the high end of fryers, you can calculate performance of a fryer in lots of ways. It can be time, cook time, it can be labor time. In this case, I wanna compare our low efficiency fryer, which some people still buy, some chains still buy. Some of you are buying the medium efficiency fryers and you could step up, right? But here's the performance of a low efficiency fryer. Drop my fries in there, dips down, okay, right down here to 310. I'm waiting, I'm waiting, they're done here. I take my fries out. I've got another minute for that thing to recover. Okay, that's a minute, it's a long damn time. In the real world, what happens? Do they wait for that fryer to recover? No, they don't. We drop more fries and the temperature dips and it dips and it dips and it dips and then I get a crappy fry from you and I'm like, no, nah, you just wrecked my day with your crappy fry, right? I like a good crisp. We have, a, oh man, we have a recipe at the lab. We like double fry and we've got all kinds of special salts and stuff. You gotta come visit us. How many people have been to the lab? San Ramon? Yeah, if you're coming out, come visit us, right? You come to Northern California, the Bay Area, come see us because we have fun. We'll make you some cool fries, okay. Anyway, low performance fryer, here's the fi high performance fryer, here's the in and out fryer. Is it, uh, there's an in and out person in the building, right? Maybe not here, he partied last night. Anyway, um, in and out will buy the really high efficiency fryer because they sell every freaking fryer they can make. So let's compare these two. Here's the low efficiency fryer, boom. Takes that long, high efficiency fryer. Um, the cook time, I, oh, let's step back one, let me just show you this, okay? By the time I've removed the fries and gotten them over the drip station, the high efficiency fryers are covered. I can barrel it all day long. They call these zero, zero recovery time fryers, right? I can go all day long with this sucker and it will not crash. It'll give me a good fry, good fry after good fry. So let's just compare them side by side. High efficiency fryer, low efficiency fryer, almost two minutes between proper operation and almost probably three quarters of a minute just on cook time alone, okay? If you have the money, buy the high efficiency fryer. If you're, if you're in business more than five years, then you have the money to do this. And we can sit down and show you the math. But buy those high efficiency fryers. Look at your cooking platform, look at your money maker, look at your beignet machine, and make sure it is bad ass, okay? And produces every bit of food it possibly can. You with me so far? An important big takeaway, you've probably seen this graphic before, the old iceberg, I still love to use this after all these years. The purchase price is really nothing compared to the fuel price, the operations, the maintenance, all the other things that go into a piece of equipment. So you need, a big, you need to paint a big picture. Look at that life cycle analysis, okay? So now this is taking me into our first sort of subject matter for my first pitch. The pitch is, um, is cutting waste as important as growth? Because like I said, we talk a lot about growth, but perhaps we need to be looking at that waste as well, and perhaps we, may de we need to make a pitch. And when I, when I uh, mentioned this to Andy last night, and I said, is cutting waste as important as growth? He went like, oh, hell yes, absolutely, right? And Andy's been in the field for a long time, so he knows this. But let's look at this um, mathematically, once again. Let's, let's look at the big picture. So here's my fryer. Let's step back from my fryer and look at the entire United States. Let's don't look at one piece of equipment, let's look at the whole big thing. And what is the energy bill that you guys pay, commercial food service, uh, energy bill across the United States, the, to the total bill? Somebody give me some numbers, pitch out some numbers to me. Come on, just pitch, pitch something, just give me a number. Terry, just, just pitch one out, anything. No idea. Well, just a guess. You guys, well, this is, well, actually, that's, prob that's really a good answer because most of you have no idea. 
which is probably one of the best answers I could get, right? Because it's not popping right in your head. You want to know what it is? $40 billion a year. It's roughly $800 billion industry. About 5% of what your, of your uh, cost to operate is uh, energy. It's about $40 billion a year. Let me put that in perspective for you guys. How many people have ever been to the National Restaurant Association show? Right? Equipment, tablewares, all that kind of stuff. Big show, right? Huge show. Giant show. Must be the biggest show in the world. Must be a lot of money there. The entire equipment, supply, tabletop, and furniture industry is $12 billion. $12 billion. That is a lot less than $40 billion. Okay, my industry's bigger than yours is right. How many people have been to a, have you ever been to a restaurant conference where they just talked energy? Hey, we got 40, you're spending 40 freaking billion dollars. Let's negotiate, let's figure this out, right? Well, you're here now, but it's, it's, it's not quite as big as the NRA show. But keep that in mind, a lot of money on the table. A lot of money on the table, okay? Um, how many people went to, anybody else go to the Food Service Equipment Supply Symposium in, Chicago, at Chicago Athletic Association, yeah, it was a pretty good event, right? And so if you remember, we were, they were talking predict predictions. That was in, was it October or September? It was somewhere, I don't know, late September, let's just call it the fall, okay? Anyway, at that time, they were predicting, this was MPD, was predicting there would be a 1% increase in traffic. On 1% increase in traffic on an $800 billion industry, it's given us about $240 million in potential increased profit. Okay, so that was a way to make more money to grow the industry, $240 million. They also were saying, hey, we're, gonna, we're thinking about increasing ticket price by a couple of percent. So that's $720 million potential dollars in profit, but I just wiped the ticket price out because I know you guys are going to be paying more for labor. And food prices will go up and energy prices. So that one's kind of a wash. The ticket price is kind of... So you have, by growth, you have a potential of about $240 million in extra profit on an $800 billion industry. The total energy bill, as we just discussed, was four, is $40 billion. If I knock off 1%, if I make a 1% energy savings, that's $400 million in profit if you put in your pocket, okay? My point is, my point is, cutting waste is as important as growth, all right? And I think as you start to sit back and look at the technomics and NPD numbers, we're seeing that, that the U.S. market is flattening out some. As Robin Ashton at FER says, we're more like Europe now. We're not in this explosive growth phase. Most of that's happening overseas. In the U.S., we're, we're sort of mature, right? So the place you're going to make more money is cutting waste. So now let's talk about this thing called energy productivity. Um, I just recently kind of learned about this and started thinking about it, and that's why I want to bring it to you. I love big picture ideas and introducing new thoughts, and as I said, it was you know, uh, 15 or so years ago that we introduced the notion of life cycle analysis to the food service world, and at the time people thought that's impossible, and now everybody realizes that's not such a big deal. So I'm introducing energy productivity today, new, a new thing here. Um, but I want to step back and talk for a moment about energy efficiency, how we've defined energy efficiency. My, so my whole organization is a bunch of engineers, a bunch of damn engineers. We finally hired a chef after 30 years, and man, has life gotten good. We have this chef now, so we can do try before you buy programs, right? But a bunch of engineers in the office, so we think in engineering ways. And so we defined energy efficiency like this. I buy some energy, I put it into an appliance, some of that energy makes it into the food product, okay, food product, and uh, so we call that energy to food over energy to appliance, and we end up with an energy efficiency number. Isn't that sexy? I can tell you guys are just like, I want some of that energy efficiency. No, it is insanely nerdy. This is an insanely nerdy way to talk about this, but when we got started, the only way we could talk about it is to be really, really technical and to really look like research lab. And we're still, I mean, we're still very technical people, but you know, my job is to communicate. So I, I came up with another way to think about this, a, a more business way, okay? And the way that I thought about it was, um, I'm buying some energy, I'm putting it into the fryer, some of that energy makes it into the food that I sold. And I care about that, because ultimately what you guys are doing is you are buying and selling energy and water, of course, right? Starbucks, is there a Starbucks person in the room? Starbucks is a huge, massive energy company. All of you are energy companies. You are buying energy and putting it into food and selling it. So you'd like that number to be big. And in fact, I changed this over to uh, really to percent dollars. So the way I like to look at this now is I bought $100 worth of energy. How much did I sell? Okay, so my new number is energy sold over energy bought. That's a little more sexy, right? That one makes more sense. 
So for the chef's low-cost fryer on his food truck that is running all day long, 30% uh, at absolute best, right? So when you add in all the downtime of that fryer, maybe that fryer has an operational efficiency of, uh, I don't know, 15%. 10, 15 percent, let's say 15 percent. What does that mean? That means the chef bought hundred dollars worth of energy, he sold fifteen dollars worth of energy, he lost 85 cents, completely lost it, waste, down the toilet, never get it back, okay? And most of our commercial food service operations, maybe we're at 50 percent kitchen efficiency. So you buy a dollar's worth, you sell, a, you sell 50 cents, you lose 50 cents. That's probably in the better operations. Does that make sense? So now that's a lot better way of looking at it than efficiency. This energy you sold divided by the energy you bought makes more sense. That's a little more sexy, right? You can take that to your procurement guys. But I think there's another way to look at this thing now, which is energy productivity. We can take it just a little bit higher because there are more inputs than just the, than just the dollars. And the way you, you look at energy productivity is you, is you take that top number, the energy you sold, and you really turn that into this notion of value. What is value? And the bottom number now becomes energy consumption, or it could just be consumption. But this opens up your model just a little bit. And I know that I'm asking, this is one where you know, you're going to have to think about this a minute. This is something that you're going to be considering. Energy productivity is, is kind of a new idea. Uh, in the United States and both in Australia, they're, they're looking at energy productivity related to gross na national product. And they're trying to uh, double our energy productivity by 2030. Right? So they're like, we're, we're using this much energy. What's the GNP look like? I'm asking you to take that down to a little more micro level. Uh, what does your energy productivity look like? But when you do that, what happens is you can put a lot of uh, inputs and outputs into this. So maybe value, what is value? Was that food output? Is that revenue? Is that transactions? Is that profit? Uh, perhaps value is customer satisfaction, okay? So Hans, we talked a little bit about this, right? Making choices on the oven. So Hans has an oven which is a big machine. It is, a, it is not what I would call an efficient piece of equipment, but it cooks the best pizza for what you do. So that, you know, when you start doing energy productivity, the notion is, hey man, customer satisfaction is important. You can relate a bunch of stuff in here, right? And that helps you justify that piece of equipment. That's fine with us. We want you to be, uh, we want you to use energy effectively, ultimately. So it's not so much about you know, freezing in the dark. There's no conservation here. The notion is you're buying a buck's worth of energy. How much can you sell? You'd like to buy a buck and sell a buck. There's always going to be some that's wasted in heat in the kitchen, right? But we want that number to be high. On the, the bottom side, that could be continuous commissioning. That could be servicing. That could be water that an appliance uses. You know, these are all essentially the consumables. Consumables, yeah. I only had, how many drinks did I have last? No. <laughs> I stayed up late working on the presentation, so if I stumble, that's, that's what I was up to. Does that kind of make sense? And there's all kind of stuff that go into appliances. So we did a rationale demo last week, and I had the class, you know, we did a little thought experiment. You've got one piece of equipment sitting under the line, a combination of it, and you think, well, maybe that doesn't relate to much else. But hell yes, it does. It relates to the water use, the sewer use. It relates to pre and post consumer waste. There's maintenance that goes into that, blowing down the boilers every night. Uh, the ventilation system that's needed for this, how does it relate to other appliances? Am I doing cook chill? Do I have refrigeration systems? All this stuff feeds in. It starts to look like a system. And this is what I'm asking you guys to think about, is how, how all of this relates to everything else. And Roger, did Roger make it in this morning, Roger McClinton, is he? Roger's back there. Okay, so this is our sustainability 2.0, man. This is it. It's the system. This is why I ask you the question about waste, right? Because that now plays into the equipment. What is, is, a, is a piece of equipment wasting food? Or how much pre-consumer waste can I cut down so I don't have to put the food in the equipment to begin with and I can cut my energy use? All of this stuff relates together, okay? So kind of a big picture thing, you're like, oh man, I've just, uh, hopefully I'm pitching out some nuggets here. And uh, this is something else cool that we did about two weeks ago. We had a, uh, a pizza cook-off competition. And what we did was we used six different technologies to cook pizzas. And we were just doing a little parbec, right? And we let people put their own sauces on and stuff. But it was cool because we cooked, you know, perfectly good pizzas out of six different technologies. There's lots of ways to skin this. And in fact, what's going to happen, you know, I promised like a glimpse at the kitchen of the future. What's going to happen is that you're going to start picking equipment, you know, that puts out a good product, but also uses less footprint, but also ups your energy productivity. Start looking at that, you know, and balancing out your pieces of equipment because there's lots of ways to do this. Your kitchen of the future will be smaller. I mean, I think I'm preaching the choir here. Smaller and more flexible, right? That's really what we're going to see. 
This was fun. Oh, by the way, you'll love this, uh, food service guys. We made everybody wear safety glasses as they were uh, putting their pizzas together. You know, I just think that's pretty good. <laughs> so we can laugh at them forever. Um, so this notion of energy productivity, what I want that to do is lead to effective energy use. Okay, I want you to, to buy energy and sell as much as you possibly can. And effective energy use, that's going to minimize your waste. As you start looking at it as a system, you're going to waste less. Okay, all this stuff ties together. So there we go. I think that's probably the hardest part. Um, I do want to give some big advice to operators out there. Okay, uh, Cultivate energy professionals in your organization and do not let them go. If there is one mistake I have seen food service companies make year after year after year is that they'll, they'll get somebody who's a real pro, they'll work for a while, the stock takes a bump, and they scrape off all their engineering talent. Okay? We happen to I have see a raised eyebrow. There's only a couple. Andy may be the only guy I know in the room who's really been there from a technical standpoint at his company for a long ass time. We work. How many people know Mark Fink? Anybody? Mark Moose Fink? Uh, design stuff for McDonald's, design stuff for Burger King, work for Wendy's. Mark works with us now. Your loss, our gain. Okay? You never should let Mark come out of your side of the business. Now, the, now it actually is your gain because you can come to us. He works for this publicly funded research organization, so you can get Mark's brain essentially for free. If you're in, how many people have got operations in Northern California, pg and &E territory? Quite a few of you, and how about Southern California? How about all of California? Yeah, anybody that's in California, we can hook you up at no cost, right, to give you some of this information. If you're outside of California and you want to pick Mark's brain, we can work as a consultant for you. But I prefer the, the free path. Anyway, I see that again and again. I just see talented people, you know, Stock takes a bump. They say the company says we'll spend more on we'll spend more on light bulbs, you know, deck fancy light bulbs, and we'll get rid of this energy guy, and then you pay for it. So don't make that mistake. I'll make a quick uh, just note that we now have to, to try and up the number of energy professionals. We put together an online training. Uh, catch me at lunch or something and talk to me about this. And I can give you more information. It's, I have limited time, but this is one of the ways that we're trying to get this information out there. Andy, once again, has used this to work with his staff and try and bring people up. And uh, just so you know that it's like really rocking, there's even a little avatar of me that guides you through the online training. So it's fun stuff. But, uh, oh, oh, a brief detour. I promised a couple of people at the table last night that I would, uh, I would show something that I, interesting that I noticed at the hotel. Uh, anybody go to, to FCSI in Nashville, the FCSI conference last year in Nashville? Nobody? That was a rocking conference. Anybody belong to FCSI? Kind of involved in any way? No, no, okay. Well, you should do that. FCSI is a lot of fun. So um, I went to FCSI last year. There was a bunch of security all over my hotel floor, tons and tons of guys. And I was like, who the hell is this? Who important is staying on my floor? So really security, tough looking people. And I kind of figured it out at some point when I realized almost everybody was wearing 1950s clothing and bow ties, right? Anybody get, you starting to get the notion? But then uh, um, I truly figured it out when I went back to my hotel room and I went to sign into my, uh, oh, and nobody would tell me though, everybody was mom. Everybody asked, I can't tell you, I can't tell you. Went to sign into my wireless and it came up, you know, hotel, blah, 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 and then Farrakhan came up. So I was like, okay, uh, the Reverend Farrakhan doesn't have that great of security apparatus. And uh, they certainly didn't appreciate it when, you know, the uh, nerdy white guy went out and told the Nation of Islam that they should hide their um, Wi-Fi password. Anyway, I was logging into the hotel a couple of days ago, and uh, this is what I saw. And you notice down at the bottom here, FBI surveillance. It's like, holy hell, what did I do? <laughs> they sending them after me? Maybe they were worried that I was going to talk about climate change. But I promise you, I'm not. I'm not going to say that. Anyway, it turns out it's the AV guy in the back. This is his. So don't, you can, anybody that's got like, you know, if that made you nervous, take a breath, take a breath. It's not the really FBI. It's, uh, it's a young guy. It's a prankster. And so I, we're kindred spirits now because I, I appreciate the prank, right? All right, so that was my detour. That was our palate cleanser before we get into uh, net zero energy. So what is zero net energy and why should you care? Here's the definition. You can pull this down on the slides and read it ad nauseum, but essentially zero net energy buildings are ultra efficient new construction and deep energy retrofits that consume only as much energy as they produce from clean renewable sources, okay? So I'm using energy, I need on-site renewable energy, photovoltaic for probably the best thing for food service, and I'm trying to balance that out. I am making as much as I'm consuming, okay? Why should you care? 
Uh, once again, those people doing business in California, which by the way, for the people who don't do business in California, keep in mind California is 13% of the United States economy. So there is money out there. I know it's a pain in the ass. I know Californians are all weird and we like to drink espresso all the time, but quality beer and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, California has laws, okay? This is what you really need to be paying attention to. Zero net energy by 2020 for all new residential buildings, by 2030 for all new commercial and 50% of existing commercial structures. 2030 is just down the road and they're expecting all commercial structures to be zero net energy. And this, this gets in my head. And they're very serious about this stuff, okay? This will happen. Um, at the state level, 50% of new state buildings, zero net energy by 2020, and all new state buildings to be zero net energy by 2025, including schools. 2020 is really just down the road, okay? Jones Lang LaSalle, some of those guys in here? Yeah, yeah, so this, this is like, you already know all this stuff. You're already lining it up. So talk to this guy, because he's, this is for real. And anybody who's doing any kind of food service in a government building or a school, you're gonna to need to play by these rules, okay? Um, anyhow, this is a big deal. And the challenge for food service, the mountain that we have to climb is this thing called energy use intensity, or EUI. And that's a big challenge, okay? Here's a graph, we're comparing energy use intensity for different end uses uh, against restaurants. So restaurants over here on the, uh, where's my little layer, there we go. Restaurants over there, right? And I'm comparing that out to school, retail, small office. So my restaurant compared to this building, lodging five times more energy per square foot compared to standard retail, seven times more energy per square foot. And that's at an energy, an average energy use intensity of 300 kbu per square foot. If that was a quick service restaurant, it would be much, much higher than that. Okay, all the way up to 800 kbtu per square foot. Okay, does so that kind of put it in perspective? We have food service or factories. They are very energy intensive. And so we've known for years we're gonna to have to deal with this notion. Now, big box retail, Walgreens, Walgreens has gone zero net energy, right? Um, but here's the thing, a 3,000 square foot uh, restaurant, food service facility can have the same energy bill, same energy uses that 30,000 square foot big box. They have an advantage in the, in the renewable energy because they got you know, 10 times more square, foot of, square footage of roof to put solar cells on. Does that make sense? That's our challenge. We're, anybody think about that? How many people uh, do sort of like retail and food service? You're sort of in both of those sides, right? So let's give you a new notion of energy use in the food service side. You, tend, you look at the Best Buy and you go, hell, that's gotta have a bigger energy bill than the McDonald's. Not necessarily, okay? Uh, it's, which is pretty interesting. So here's this energy use intensity um, it, for an office building. About 92 is a typical office building when you get down in Seattle. Anybody been to the Bullet Building in Seattle or heard about this, the Internet Energy Building in Seattle? They, they're down in this uh, 20 range. You kind of need to get in the 20 to 30 range to do zero net energy. That's kind of the energy use intensity that you can match out on a commercial space with PV. Okay, we're starting to sense that maybe uh, this could be a challenge for food service because when I start comparing food service to buildings, there's that average energy use intensity of 350, there's the quick service restaurant. Holy smokes, that's a big damn difference. We're gonna get from here to there? I don't know about that, okay? But McDonald's tried. McDonald's made a, a study on this, okay? So they worked with um, Rocky Mountain Institute, New Buildings Institute and ourselves, and we modeled it out and we started talking, is this possible? Let's do a thought experiment. And you, by the way, you can uh, download the articles. There's a great uh, webinar from the BBA. You can check that out. And what we realized was that reaching net zero begins with up to a 60% uh, improvement in energy efficiency versus an already efficient US prototype from 2013. So that means you're gonna go to the most efficient chain store and you're gonna cut the energy use by uh, more than half, okay? That's a big number right off. That's a huge challenge right off. And then you have to install 300 kW worth of photovoltaics on the roof and the parking lot of that space. That's a lot of PV. This is what it looks like, okay? So there's PV over the store, there's PV in front of the store, all along the side over here, there's another big PV array. Pretty much the whole lot is covered with PV. That's 300 kW. But, you know, it's theoretically, kind of theoretically possible, um, but tough. Right, particularly for somebody like McDonald's, which is very equipment intensive. Maybe for a Starbucks, we might be able to do that. Starbucks with a parking lot, that's, that starts to match up a little bit better. But here's a catch. This definition of zero net energy and the way the codes are working is, they want you to do zero net energy based on the source, the energy source and not the site. 
Okay? So right here, we're using energy on this building. There's a meter, and, the, and the, what that meter reads is site energy. Down the road, there's a power plant, and they're sticking energy into that power plant. That's the source energy. The source energy is about three times bigger than the site energy. Okay? So this McDonald's would need three times the amount of photovoltaics. I don't know where the hell they're going to put that. Okay? They're going to have to put PVs on the workers' hats and on the cars and, on, you know, on the wrappers, it's just, now it starts to look a little bit impossible. So the McDonald's study demonstrates that for high energy intensity building types, such as restaurants, every single piece of energy using equipment must be examined as part of a system. This was one way we were gonna get to that 60% reduction, was really look at equipment, change up the technologies, do more on-demand, uh, electric on-demand technologies, but the whole thing had to be looked at as a system and uh, that brings us back to that, once again, back to that notion of energy productivity, looking at everything as a system if you want to cut waste, if you want to make gains. All right? Have I just scared the living hell out of you? Like, oh my God, my head's going to explode. Richard, I'm, I'm a food service person. It's all right. This is just going to come to you. I'm just trying to open the doors, give you some big picture, give you a little bit heads up so you know where this is going. But it is going there, okay? Uh, regardless of politics, administrations, what people say, media, et cetera, the ball is rolling. Big companies, insurance companies, food service companies, if you read the news, if you look at all of the stuff that's out there, this is where we're headed. Within a few years, PV will be cheaper than coal. Coal will go away simply because of economics. All right. This is a worldwide phenomenon. It's not just related to the United States. We talk some about China. China is competing hard in this. The uh, United States should be, have our head in the game. Make sense? This is just going to happen. It's just cost of energy in the end. It is good business. Uh, that's exactly what Roger said, right? It's good business. That's exactly what you said. So a couple of final notes here. Z uh, zero net energy may be impossible for most restaurants. So what are we going to do in California in 2030 when they want us all commercial to be... That's going to be a tough one. Um, you, may, you may have to do zero net carbon, where you're buying RECs, right? Where you're buying renewable energy. Right now, that's not allowed. That is not considered a zero net energy building, which means that this, inter this industry needs to start thinking about this. And we probably need to start working together and talking to codes officials and getting our voice out there. And in fact, I'm going to make a pitch for this industry that you need to get your voice to the utilities regardless. How many people go to EEI? Anybody out there? How many people know? A utility rep, do you have a utility rep that you work with, a national accounts person? A few of you, but not many, right? Everybody should be raising their hands. So I want food service people to start making your voices heard to the utilities. California, we've done a pretty good job of serving the industry. Most of the rest of the United States, the utilities have not done a very good job of serving you. Okay, and part of that's because food service is diverse, it's complicated, we all hunker down, we don't sit there and really uh, uh, make our voice heard to the utilities. So do that, start making your voices heard. Say, I want more service, I want you guys to step up. The people that have tried to help you, and there's you know, a few people, few of our allies across the US have done a great job, but they have very limited horsepower. They will get more horsepower from you guys. And when you start saying, we have challenges with bills, we have challenges with zero net energy, the whole energy game is changing. The smart grid, renewables online. How many people have heard of a thing called the duck curve? No, this is a shift in demand because of the way that renewables are coming online. Lots of stuff to talk about, so we need to have this dialogue, okay? And listen, I fully realize that you, this is a food service industry, and you know this is mind-blowing stuff, but like I say, just take it, a, take it a step at a time. But here's, when I tried to explain to utility people how the food service industry works, and you know, sort of use a pop culture uh, analogy, <clears throat> I like to go to Han Solo, because I figure Han Solo represents the perfect restaurateur, you know, super brave, take any chances, go anywhere, owes everybody money, all right? And uh, so here's my analogy, here's Han Solo, he says, he's calling his friend, Hey, I just opened up a new restaurant. It's called Lightspeed Pizza, right? And one week later, one week later, yeah, I'm still open, but damn, this restaurant business is hard. Is that not true? With that, you guys, I'll say thanks, and uh, thanks, Michael, for having me. Thank you so and, much, Rich. Yeah, thanks for showing up this morning. Thank you so much. <laughs> I guess we have time for, uh, for a couple of questions. Sure, questions? awesome. Any questions out there? Any questions? Is, is anybody left with like gray matter after all that? <laughs> I guess you gave them all the information. They don't have any questions. Mm. <laughs> okay. Oh, Roger. Yes. Uh oh, here comes a hard question. <laughs> By the way, Roger, Yum Brand has done an excellent job of um, creating industry prof energy professionals and keeping them on the job. 
right? Dave Harpering, Jonathan Bialis, um, Mike Harlemer, all these guys were, you know, rock stars in my eyes. And, and you've saved a lot of money because of that, right? No, I appreciate it. It's been a very collaborative effort, and we love yeah. your system and your service, you know, group tremendously. So we appreciate the partnership. So, you know, th these are big challenges, and we kind of don't see them coming. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, if you can't get to net zero by the 2020 or 2030, depending on which marketplace you're in, what does that mean? That you don't open, right? That you are, don't have license to do business in that state? So really, I mean, mm -hmm. the implications, we hear all this because, you know, it sounds like it's coming, but the reality is it will be here, and does that mean that you don't have the license to operate in that state, et cetera? So tell, tell us about what the implications are. Yeah, and I think this is, I think it's time for my answer to be I don't know, right? Because I think this is, this is the big question mark. We, we kind of need to start having this discussion. Uh, I think it's time to try to talk to some energy commissioners. Um, I, I met one of the energy commissioners last year. I went to a zero net energy conference. I have the water bottle to prove it, okay, getting to zero. Uh, but I think it's time to open this dialogue up because that was my thought. As I started putting the numbers together and then I'm looking at the codes, I'm going, wait, something doesn't fit and there needs to be some education. The people that are kind of doing zero net energy now and, and getting it right are schools. And it's not such a big deal because schools have a lot of roof space and a really low energy use intensity. But when you start trying to you know, cut this down to a restaurant, I, we're going to have issues. And it's kind of like the notion of, I think we've been around this a little bit, where people would say every, every facility has to be lead in the city, something like that. There will probably be ways to deal with it. And I think that that solution, if I had to take a guess, I would say what our industry needs to do uh, probably working with the National Restaurant Association, the California Restaurant Association, um, who are partners of ours, right? We work with these guys, is to get to legislation, get to the rule makers and say, hey, let's start looking at food service and making exceptions. I think you're probably gonna end up buying uh, uh, Rex, though. I think you're probably gonna have to buy clean energy, zero net carbon. And what that means is that, you know, that, that can be more expensive energy, so you really need to cut your waste so that you can do that. Um, I do that at my house, by the way. I, um, there's, a, there's a program with PG&E, and I'm just, I, don't have any, I don't have a very good roof for solar cells, and so I just buy all green power on my energy bill, and PG&E offsets it for me, and it's, I don't know, 10 bucks a month or something. It's not much. I haven't seen a big change. Question, yes? So the, the challenge seems to be when you're with PG&E, and mm -hmm. I'm down in the Southern California side, and so we have Edison. Yeah. yeah. You almost have to have a master's degree to figure out where these rebates and try to find them. Why they bury them, why it's not, you know, you want, or not you, but mm -hmm. the industry wants us to be more efficient, but we can't find the energy savings or incentives. You have to hire an outside firm, you mm -hmm. know. Is there any way, or is that part of your technology center? Oh, yeah, yeah, here, I owe you Save. money for that question. Oh, damn, that's a good question here. <laughs> yes, um, who, who can guess <clears throat> a website that you might go to to find rebates? <laughs> Fishnick.com. Fishnick.com. Yeah, so this is a great question because we, we crossed this boundary in uh, California probably around 2000, we, we, we hit this. And it was uh, Julianne Rogers with Carl Karcher's who said that exact same thing in a utility meeting. She said, we're like, Julianne, you're buying all these broilers. We have a rebate for it. Why aren't you taking the rebates? You're buying fryers. Why aren't you taking the rebates? And she said, there's a different rebate, a different form for every utility. I don't have time, because once again, a lot of times there's one energy person in the entire firm. I don't have time to figure this out. Um, so we said, okay, this is great. We're gonna try and unify our program. So within California, we do have a thing called California Energy Wise. And if you look at that, it has the four big utilities. It has Edison, SoCal Gas, San Diego Gas and Electric, and PG&E, all on the same page, and all of our rebates listed. And as much as possible, with very few exceptions, the rebates are the same throughout California for all of those big utilities. And now we've added LADWP, which is the huge municipal utility in the city of LA. So if you go to fishnick.com, right on the home page, it says rebates. I mean, it's hard to miss. You click on that, there's a rebate page, and all of the forms are there. You can, get, you can see what qualifies. There's, there are spreadsheets that give you model numbers. You know, all the data is there, right? And I can show you, um, we can play around with this, right? Um, but everything is there. All of that and all the calculators and everything else. So we hear you. And what we now want to do is try and figure a way to spread that across the United States. That's the other, that's the other question. It's like, yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. Outside of California, it is hard. It's hard to do. Some utilities are better than others, um, but it is really tough. I've been to utilities where I was going to speak, and I want to know what the rebate was, and I click on the website, and it would take me to another website, and I'd say, you know, uh, how do I get back to this? And it just ends up a circle. I never find the number. Yeah. I, they're raising the lights. It's like the damn Academy Awards. Yeah. Play the music. So we <laughs> <laughs> but again, as always, excellent job, and thanks so much for joining us. Great. Thank you so much, you guys.